What is electrical charge? Well, like mass, uh, electrical charge is needed in order for an electric force or a magnetic force to actually act on a particular object. Now, why I bring up mass is because objects with mass, of course, are subject to the gravitational force, which is a fundamental force. Objects with charge, electrical charge, again, can be affected by the electric field if they're not moving. If they are moving, then the magnetic fields can uh, act on them, as we'll see later on. Um, electric charge is primarily found in uh, different parts of the atom, uh, specifically the electron and the proton. And we'll see why it's normally the electrons movement or an excess of electrons or a lack of electrons, which is responsible for electric forces and electric fields. So what is the first observation of the electric force? Well, the first observation that has been recorded uh, was made by the Greeks. I'm sure other cultures also observed uh, a similar phenomena, but uh, it was recorded that um, the Greeks found that when we took amber and rubbed it against uh, fur, that uh, a static charge would build up and this would attract small pieces of straw or feathers. Of course, the Greeks also uh, discovered the magnetic force too, but uh, in both cases, they really didn't understand why they were observing the phenomena that they saw. Later on, as time went by, we started to understand these forces a little bit better. And surprisingly, Benjamin Franklin, who's one of the founding fathers, he was uh, really you know, responsible for so many different things. He was a printer, he was an author. Um, in addition to being a founding father, he was an inventor, he was a diplomat. Uh, most people don't realize that he was a, a very active scientist. And his work in the 1740s, even before the American Revolution, uh, helped us understand that the electric force is actually uh, mediated by two different charges. And he called these charges positive and negative. Of course, he's famous for flying this kite and observing the um, electrical effects of a thunderstorm, you know, demonstrating that like charges repel, unlike charges attract. Um, but, uh, you know, beyond that, his understanding of the electric charge was more of a qualitative understanding. And he didn't really have uh, an entire understanding of, of what was happening on a smaller scale or how the force would be affected by different amounts of charge. Again, he didn't really quantify this. Now, again, we will see that in most cases, this electric charge will be caused by the buildup of excess electrons or the lack of electrons. Uh, for example, if we take a positively charged object, it will attract like, I'm sorry, it will attract opposite charges. Why? Because with a missing number of electrons compared to protons, it wants to equalize those numbers out. If we look at something that's negative, it's going to repel other electrons because with an excess of negative charge, the light charges will want to get away from one another. And therefore, um, any negative charge will, will be repelled by that. It's important to understand that because we can't easily create or destroy um, protons and, and electrons, and in fact, even if we, when, when we do annihilate them, charge is always conserved. Um, charge is one of the, the quantities in nature that uh, must always, always be conserved. And um, it's probably pretty good to assume that uh, the universe has a net electric charge of zero, and that whenever we create a positive charge, we're not really creating the positive charge per se, but we're separating 
positively charged particles such as protons from negatively charged particles such as electrons. Now, charge is not only conserved, charge is quantized. And this is very simple to think about. All electrons have the same charge. All protons have the same charge, okay? The proton has a charge of what we say plus E. It's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs, whereas the electron has a charge of negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So essentially, whenever we charge an object, as we said, we're normally adding extra electrons or getting rid of electrons or removing electrons. And therefore, every time we are changing the charge, we're doing it in some discrete amount where the charge change would be and the number of electrons that we're moving or the number of protons that we're moving times E, which is the elementary charge or 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. So again, charge is quantized. We can only change charge by some integer value N times E. Okay, uh, quarks are a little bit of the exception here, but uh, quarks in themselves are, are a little bit strange in terms of the fact that charge it, quarks can only exist as, in threes, as is the case for the protons. So even though they have fractional charge, all the fractions add up to be equal to plus one. Um, or in the case of mesons, you have a quark and an antiquark, which have opposite charges. So um, those values will cancel out. So again, charge is not only conserved, charge is also quantized. Now again, um, the easiest way to get electricity to flow is to move electrons about. And it's fairly obvious when we look at the mass and the structure of the atom, why this takes place. Now, both particles have equal and opposite charges. This means that when placed in an electric field, both particles will feel the same amount of force, okay? However, let's look at the mass. The mass of the proton is much, much larger, okay? 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27, than the charge of the electron, okay? I'm sorry, the mass of the electron. So the mass of the electron is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31. So looking at that, you know, we can round up 9.11 to about times 10 to the minus 31 to about 10 to the minus 30. Comparing 10 to the minus 30 to roughly 10 to the minus 27, that means that our proton is more than a thousand times more massive than our electron, okay? Think about Newton's second law. Newton's second law of motion states that force, the force that we place on an object, is equal to its mass times its acceleration, okay? Likewise, the acceleration of a particle is going to be equal to its force, the net force acting on it, divided by its mass. So it's much easier to accelerate, to move an electron, okay? It's over a thousand times easier if we relate ease to acceleration than it is to move a proton. It's just simply a matter of mass. It is the lighter particles that will move in an electric field much more readily than the positive charges. Also take a look at the structure of the atom, okay? The nucleus is positively charged. If we think about the nucleus in, uh, inside it, you have positively charged protons and they're bound to uh, neutral neutrons in most cases. You know, hydrogen, one is the exception because it's only a single proton. But if we think about this, all these particles are bound by the strong force. Okay, so 
taking a single proton off a nucleus and getting it to move an electric field is really, really unlikely and very difficult to do. So really, if you're gonna place the nucleus in an electric field and get it to move, you've got to drag along all the particles with it, all the protons, all the neutrons. As we're talking about larger and larger atomic numbers, we're talking about just a more massive um, particle, which is of course positively charged due to the charge of the protons, but increasingly more difficult to move as the number of neutrons proportion to the protons becomes greater and greater. Contrast that with the electrons, which are bound to the um, atom, they're bound to the nucleus, but with much, much less force than the protons are bound to the nucleus, okay? The protons are there because of the strong force. The electrons are there because of the electric force. And as we'll see, the electric force drops off by one over the distance squared. It's an inverse square relationship. So again, these very light electrons, they're easy to move, comparative, easy to move, compared to the much heavier protons, which are typically locked in the nucleus. So when we get electric charge to move, when we produce electricity, it is typically the electrons which are carrying the charge. So you tip the electrons which are carrying the electricity. Now, there are exceptions to this rule, okay? When there are no free electrons available to move, um, as we have in electrolyte solutions, we move the ions, okay? The ions are positively and negatively charged. And yes, they're very, very massive. But without any electrons to move, we'd move the ions in that case.